Marvin Gaye was a superstar, a Motown legend. He was the prince of Motown. He was truly that, that kind of a person. He had that kind of charisma where the ladies just loved him. But the smooth exterior and golden voice hit another very different Marvin Gaye. Paranoid, suicidal, addicted to cocaine. When he was good, he was really, really good. And when he was bad, he just wanted to get the hell out of the way. In 24 hours, a lifelong family feud would finally come to an end. Marvin will be dead, shot by his father. March 31st, 1984. Marvin Gaye is one of the most successful recording artists in the world. After a grueling year-long tour, he's retreated to his parents' house in LA. In less than 24 hours, he'll be dead. For the past six months, Marvin has been struggling with a growing depression. There came a time when he just put on a, 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 a bathrobe and was just there in the house. He was just, he just never left. It was crazy, dog. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? Marvin Gaye is addicted to cocaine. Since moving in with his parents, his use has increased steadily. It's caused tension with his father, having junkies and dealers constantly coming to the house. When Marvin came back to LA, he just wanted to be left alone, but everybody came out of the woodwork. So there was constant traffic at the house, day and night. You know, yeah, we can party here. Yeah. Any Maybe normal household you know, doesn't have yeah. 20 or 30 people coming and going all day long, every day. And it gets old very quick, and, and Father was just tired of it. It's a little too much activity for him. He liked to remain peaceful in his room without any activity going on around him. Marvin and his father have been locked in a power struggle since he was a child. But now Marvin is the breadwinner. He bought the family home in LA, a fact his father resents. There's a struggle between who is going to be the head of that family and theories, life and religion and everything else, and all the blow and everything that's going on there in his house, as father would think, I guess, which it was, I guess. The one person who's always held the family together is Marvin's mother. She has her own bedroom between her husband and her son. I think the, the deal that Marvin had was he started putting his mother in the middle of it because, you know, I can't fight you back, Daddy, but I can get Mama for you. And, and she loved him to death. And uh, he, he basically used his mom, you know, against his dad. Marvin's mom, in many ways, was a peacemaker and a negotiator and a referee and a nurturer. I think that she was his anchor. I think that she was the one place that he felt loved. My father always knew there was a closeness between um, Marvin and his wife. He always knew that. Marvin's father is jealous of their relationship and his son's success. They were like in two different worlds. They didn't acknowledge each other. I've never seen such a strained relationship between two people. You could kind of feel uh, the vitriol. You know, there, there seemed to be some love there, but it just, they were always in conflict. They were always seemingly in conflict. In 22 hours, the bitter hatred between father and son will explode in violence.
45 years before, in Washington, D.C., Marvin Pence Gay was born, the second of four children, the son of a preacher. My father was a very strict man. Um, he believed in um, discipline, very much so. And being a man minister in a church, <clears throat> and you know what people say about preachers' children, <laughs> sometimes feel the worst. I've heard that all my life. <laughs> so he was determined we were not gonna be the worst. He just wanted the perfect family. And everything had to run the way that father wanted it because he had this dream of, you know, the perfect family. Marvin's father enforced his will through violence. We were punished and Marvin received more punishment than the rest of us because he was a, a maverick. I always called him that. Even as a child, he did things differently. Marvin would test father. Frankie would tell me Marvin would test father a, lo a lot. The power struggle that they had actually was um, um, in many ways a, a, a way that Marvin sought approval and acceptance from his dad. Instead of using compassion, softness, tenderness, then he began to dictate and dominate. And he became a force, a power in his family, which turned his children. From age seven, Marvin suffered routine whippings. He also had to endure the shame of having a father who wore women's clothing. His father was not only a cross-dresser, but he was a very flamboyant and um, out there cross-dresser. He'd have his little, you know, ladies' slippers on, pumps, and, you know, uh, slide around sandal things and waltz around. He was proud of it, so he didn't care. Neighbors knew about Marvin's father. Kids called him names, sissy and homosexual. Uh, the image of his dad as a preacher, this powerful, cross-dressing, church front preacher who would come home and wear his wife's clothes. The shame that that imposed upon Marvin. Marvin's childhood was a daily torment, full of pain and confusion. His salvation was music. At age five, Marvin began singing gospel. His voice won him instant praise. People were amazed at his voice. He loved all the attention he was getting. All the nice things they were saying to my mother and father. Right, where did this boy get such a beautiful voice? Marvin's voice was his ticket out of his father's house. By his late teens, Marvin was singing for money. His father was furious. To him, it was the devil's music. He did not sanction his son going into the secular world. And that was one of the things that hurt him so bad. He was permitted to do it or to venture into that field by his mother. She supported him. She encouraged him. Um, and I think that that is one of the primary reasons that she was so important in his life. She, he, she symbolized for him um, what it would be like, unconditional love. Resented by his father, indulged by his mother, this dynamic would define Marvin Gaye's life. But it was his father's ominous threat that would end it. My father has always taught us, even from children, that we don't talk back, number one. And we certainly don't act as though we want to do any harm, number two. And um, he's always said if we did anything, to raise our voices at him in that manner or to strike, that he brought us in this world, he can take us out. He should tell us that we were little kids. The children knew to take his threat seriously. 
and on the last day of Marvin Gaye's life, his father would prove himself a man of his word. Los Angeles, California. It's late afternoon. Soul superstar Marvin Gaye has just 18 hours to live. He's staying with his parents, a father who beat him as a child, and a mother who's always been his strongest support. Marvin and his mother had a wonderful relationship. They were really close and, you know, shared a lot of things together, and they loved to laugh together. You could walk, you know, down the hall in the house, and you would hear laughter coming from the bedroom. And uh, they, they had a good time together. But there was always tension in the house. It doesn't take much for things to erupt, you know that. So that particular day, of course, was a day that um, my father had been drinking. And there was an argument with my mother over some business papers. Unpaid taxes and two divorces have forced Marvin to sell off his properties. Gay Senior is worried his home might be in jeopardy. There was just a lot of... Everything folding, the studio's gone, you know, the how Hidden Hills is going, this is going, that's going, it's all, it's all gone. What else is gonna go? And I think it might have been in the, in the back of father's mind. Plus, him just trying to make sure that he, his son knew that he was a failure, no matter how famous he was. Look at that! Mother! Yeah. Yeah. Mother! <laughs> Knowing my father, he probably raised his voice at my mother. I don't think Marvin would have intervened if, if he didn't think he had to protect my mother from something. Hey, who do you think? What are you talking about? What are you looking well, at? Knowing me Marvin, for? he probably looking told him not to talk to his Get mother that way. Hey, you talk and knowing my father, he probably told him to stay That's out of my it. Wife. <laughs> I know when Marvin again, he probably stayed in it. Listen, look. Don't you Get ever. Out you. Get out. Get up. Marvin, Marvin, please don't speak to the father. Marvin's reliance on cocaine is making him edgy, volatile, and paranoid. He's convinced someone is trying to kill him. He had a 38 pistol in his pocket at all times, loaded. I told him about how worried I was. In fact, he was doing these drugs and he was never came out of the house, and he'd walk around with this loaded pistol. And I said, I'm really worried about this. He said, oh, Dave, you don't have to be worried. But there's good reason to worry. The house is stockpiled with weapons. When Marvin moved back home six months ago, he gave a gun to his father. You know, one of the biggest ironies is that Marvin thought he was being uh, chased and followed and pursued, and someone was looking to kill him. So he gave his father a gun so his father might shoot the person looking to kill Marvin. It was a fateful decision. Marvin had put the gun in the hand of his killer. <laughs> 23 years before, Motown, the music industry machine that would soon churn out a dizzying number of hits, was just finding its feet. In 1960, Motown was the only record label that gave black artists a shot at becoming superstars. Marvin Gaye was chasing that dream. He was a drummer and, you know, he hung around the studio and he was looking to get uh, noticed. Um, and the competition was keen, you know. His initial struggle at Motown was to get people to pay attention to him. Marvin's boyish good looks caught the public's eye. His velvet voice made them listen. In just over a year, he had a hit song, Stubborn Kind of Fellow. Gay was making a name for himself, but with the spotlight came hurtful rumors. They came to my dressing room and said, you have a call backstage. And I went to the phone, and when I got there, they said, uh, did you know that Marvin was gay? I just hung up the phone, because I, I got upset about it. But people, people teased him about the G-A-Y. Marvin wasn't gay, but questions about his sexuality brought back the shame he felt as a child, as the son of a cross-dresser. Before going on tour, Gay added an E to the end of his name. 
but on stage there was no confusion. To his female fans, Marvin Gaye was a sex symbol. I remember on one of the Motown reviews, the fans went crazy. And, I, and I'm walking down this big hallway, and I hear somebody say, Kim Weston, Kim Weston, oh, man, I'm glad to see you. And I look around here, Mom and hiding in the doorway. And I said, what are you doing? He said, they're everywhere. All the girls were after him, so he's going to walk with me to find out where I was going. As soon as we walked out the door, there was a bunch of them. I said, oh, there he is. And he just didn't know what to do. He tried to run, but they got him. So I walked onto the bus. I said, I think you all better go rescue Marvin, because they got him back there. Marvin had his pick of admirers. In 1963, he chose Anna Gordy, sister of Motown head Berry Gordy. She was 17 years older than him. There was a mother image there, and uh, I think he saw things in her that he may have desired his mother to have, because his mother was very passive. And Anna was, yeah, she was out there. Anna was more than a mother figure. She was a powerful woman who could help his career. Like everything else in Marvin's life, I think Marvin's relationship to Anna was really complicated. I think they loved each other deeply, but she was a Gordy, you know, and he saw in her a way to climb the ladder of success and give him a head start in everybody else. Soon, Marvin got top billing and became one of Motown's biggest names. He had a unique style. It was so unusual that his recording of I Heard It Through the Grapevine was initially shelved. It was so different, we just could not picture it in the top 10. We knew it was good, we, we, it was super good, but it, just, it was just way too different. And so finally they decided to recut the song on Gladys Knight and the Pips. I Heard It Through the Grapevine was a hit for Gladys Knight and the Pips. The song's success convinced Motown to release Marvin's version in 1968. It immediately outsold Gladys Knight's and became Motown's biggest single ever, selling nearly four million copies. What it did for Marvin was it gave him clout. Uh, and it uh, set him up for his next move, which was, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to be produced by any anybody else. I'm going to write this suite of songs that pays no attention to what they're uh, playing on the radio these days. I'm going to become an artist with a capital A, and that means my first allegiance is to my art and not to commerce and not to making Mr. Gordy happy or anybody else happy, that I have to make my own sort of personal uh, muse happy, and I have to answer to God, not to the Motown Corporation. So, Heard It Through the Grapevine was the key that unlocked the door to Marvin's independence. The success of Grapevine freed Marvin of the controlling influence of Barry Gordy and allowed him to record the songs that would make him a superstar. Evening has fallen on Los Angeles. Marvin Gaye has just 15 hours to live. He is staying with his parents in LA, where he spent the afternoon in a bitter argument with his domineering father. Marvin is addicted to cocaine. In his paranoid delusions, he believes someone is trying to kill him. For protection, he stocked the house with guns, but now fears his brother, who lives next door, wants to harm him. Where's my gun? You need a gun. What do you mean I need a gun? People are after me. You don't need a gun. I need a gun. Come on, Marvin. Frankie said, Marvin, you don't need a gun. And he goes, oh, even you've turned against me. Now I can't trust you. Calm down. I knew where the gun was, so I went and got it. And I made sure there were no bullets in it. And I gave Frankie the gun. I my gun, man because I saw how upset Marvin was getting. Give me my gun! And he took the gun from Frankie, and he checked, and 
There were no bullets. So he got really upset because he wouldn't help him. And then he walked out the door. And before he slammed it, he just said, even you're not my friend anymore. You've turned against me. Well, just you are not my brother. You are not my brother. Desperate, Frankie calls their friend, Dave Simmons, to come up with a plan to help Marvin. Dave, hey, it's Frankie. Listen, man. We were just, just determined to do something. We had we no idea what we were going to do exactly, whether we had to actually physically restrain him. We had no idea where we were going to uh, try to take him to, but we just knew that we had to do something. Frank was just like, you know, what it, what have I done wrong? You know, I'm just trying to protect him. We, Frankie knew what state of mind he was in and how he was just being tormented inside and was totally miserable, and he just didn't want to see him get in more trouble. He was crazy. He, he, he had gotten really really just gone really crazy, you know, and the way Frankie described, the way he looked physically, you know, he said he was just, had his coat all buttoned, kind of crazy, and he was just out of it, gone, you know. Dave and Frankie are convinced Marvin needs treatment. Marvin had told my mother he was going to go to a hospital and dry himself out, and she was holding him to that promise, and he was gearing up towards it, too. So he never went, but he was going to. In reality, Marvin's cocaine abuse is getting worse. In the last few years, he'd started freebasing. The drug was killing him slowly. It was crazy because it destroyed him, basically, because, you know, all of most of the membranes in his nose were gone. It burned out. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know. Uh, you know, he, he, he always smoked, but that was nothing, you know, just smoke. But then I think he probably smoked less and just did more, more cocaine. And, uh, just got to the point where he just, just took over everything, and, you know, he was just, just not himself at all, you know. Many black people um, have a very high tolerance for discomfort. I believe that, you know, we feel bad. We feel bad all the time, and that's just the way it is for us, and we'll deal with it. So I'm not surprised at all that Marvin Gaye never sought treatment, because I think that he believed that he should be able to do this on his own. In the final hours of his life, Marvin was a slave to his addiction and at war with his father. The deadly combination of drugs and conflict would soon end his life. Fourteen years earlier, the Vietnam War was at its height, and Marvin Gaye was about to hit his peak. With the success of I Heard It Through the Grapevine, Marvin had won creative control over his next album. Marvin had a lot of talent and a lot of creativity, but he had more ability than most of the producers that were there at the time. Marvin took inspiration from the Vietnam War to write one of the most successful concept albums of all time. What's Going On was a tribute to his brother, Frankie, who fought in the war. What's Going On, Marvin dedicated to Frankie because of all his stories, he gave him the inspiration to write that album. It was a masterpiece. With What's Going On, Marvin resurrected deeply held spiritual beliefs. He was delivering a message about poverty, racism, and war. Marvin was the type of man who carried the world on his shoulders. Everything affected him. He felt he wanted to do something about it, and the only way he could do anything about it, he thought, was through music. Marvin wanted his music to matter, that he would be the voice of someone um, that would inspire social change. But Motown was about upbeat dance music. Barry Gordy hated what's going on. He refused to release it. Barry Gordy's reaction was, was one of, of, of how would a Marvin Gaye fan relate to this? Marvin came to, to, to my hotel room after I left Motown. 
And he told me, he says, Kim, he says, I recorded the best album I've ever done, and nobody likes it. Not my wife, not Barry Gordy, nobody likes it. And I said, Marvin, did you, do you like it? He says, it's the best thing I've ever done. Marvin swore he'd never record another song unless Motown released What's Going On. They did in 1971. It was an immediate sensation. Half a million copies sold in the first day. Tonight, I'm so proud to have the greatest singer in the world in the auditorium tonight. It's Marvin Gaye. The next year, Marvin made a triumphant return home. Washington, D.C. proclaimed May 1st Marvin Gaye Day. It gave Marvin something he'd never had before, the respect and admiration of his father. To be held by his father in public, oh, yes. <laughs> that was a wonderful thing for my father to walk up to him and say, son, I'm so proud of you. This is, this is wonderful. You have really caused me to be very proud of you. And so that was a good thing, very good. I wasn't there for Marvin Gaye Day in 1972, but, but I have a feeling it was, you know, he talked about it a lot, and I think it was a big deal. I think it was like a little happy moment, actually, you know, one of these uh, Polaroid pictures where Mommy and Daddy and Marvin were reunited, and I think it was sweet. Everyone in the community came, and it was a big deal, and, and then Wham, and, you know, people in Motown and others may not have known Marvin's family that well saw, and I think it just, they were in the public's eye, and so I think he wanted to do the right thing, and I think he really, it, you know, just had a change of heart. He was going to give it his good shot. He was going to do his part if Dad would do his part. I think it's one of those uh, snapshots um, out of his life of uh, perhaps what could have been had there been true harmony between mom, dad, and Marvin, had there been some kind of reconciliation, had there been some kind of deep understanding. On that day, it was okay. But that day was a very isolated day and a very extraordinary day and a day not at all typical. Tragically, this was a fleeting moment of happiness. Father and son would never find a lasting peace. The years of conflict and violence had left scars too deep to heal. It's early morning in LA. Marvin Gaye has less than four hours to live. Yesterday's argument over money has been simmering since last night. Marvin's sister-in-law brings breakfast for his mother. She tells her to give it to Marvin. Even this small act of favoritism is seen as an insult by Marvin's father. You could just tell. You could tell when father's mom, just by the, the glare down the hallway. He was upset that mother didn't say, give father the breakfast instead of give Marvin the breakfast. Because I believe father built up a jealousy over Marvin and mother's relationship because she paid so much attention to Marvin. Marvin was her baby. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if there was any choice between the two, it would always be Marvin. And, you know, he loved her so much. And uh, uh, if there was any animosity or jealousy, it would be would have been on the father's part, because I don't think Marvin felt that, uh, you know, she favored the father over him at any time. As she sets down the breakfast, Marvin's sister-in-law notices he's in a bad way. Marvin didn't look well. He looked absolutely wiped out. He, he looked like he hadn't slept for days. He just looked tired. It was almost like he just wanted to give up. 
Make sure you have some later, okay? It'll make you feel better. In fact, over the last few weeks, those who knew him well believed Marvin was contemplating suicide. Oh. He had a uh, desire not to, to live. And so when I think of it in terms of the uses of drugs and everything, he was basically trying to take himself out. But he was a very strong individual. As he wakes, Marvin is in pain physically and mentally. He's exhausted, his body wrecked by years of drug abuse. He was a man looking for a way out. Ten years earlier, Marvin was at the top of his game. What's going on had secured his place among the greats of soul music. With his career on track, he tried to make a fresh start with his family. He moved to Hollywood and bought his parents a house in L.A. But his success failed to bring the gay family closer together. Well, once we moved into what we call the big house on Gramercy, things started deteriorating, I would say. I noticed that my father was becoming more and more recluse, which meant he didn't want to go anywhere or do anything. And it was my mother who was going places and doing things. My, my mother would accompany my brother on his tours. And, but it's not that he never asked my father. He would always ask him, and he would always say no. Marvin's father still frowned on his son's career, even though he lived off his royalties. His father withheld the approval to his son to the point of destroying him. Unfortunately, I beg to differ on father. I think he was, uh, he was, he was very, very poisoned by negativity. And his import, it was important to him to play takeaway with, his, with people that wanted something from him. And uh, Marvin really wanted it from him. He, he hated him. He loved him at the same time. You know, it's, it's just, he didn't want any acknowledgement from him. Then he really wanted everything from him. So it was just like, it just became a curse on Marvin, you know? And it just drove him into everything in his life like that. His music, his relationships, his, his kids, everything. Marvin pulled away from his father again and immersed himself in the L.A. music scene. L.A. in the 1970s had this kind of coke plague, you know, where every, you know, everybody was tooting and rooting and, and going crazy with cocaine, particularly in the, in the music world. It wasn't long before Marvin was addicted to cocaine. I saw it increase. First, it was just a little bit here and there. If there were parties or this and that, it, was, it became uh, just off the hook eating it, you know, smoking it, you know, any kind of way you can take it. It made him real nervous and uptight and paranoid. Uh, all the symptoms of those, of that type of a drug, you know. Marvin's marriage to Anna Gordy fell apart and he hooked up with 16-year-old Janice Hunter. She was just this absolutely gorgeous um, uh, teenager. They met while Marvin was recording Let's Get It On, his tribute to sexual freedom. She became his second wife, and Marvin set about creating his ideal woman. I think he saw in Jan a way to mold a woman, you know, take this teenager and, and turn her into what he thought a woman should be. Marvin's ideal woman was his mother, but it was an image no one could live up to. I believe that he held her up as a standard by which he gauged uh, the morality, the, the ability to commit, the perseverance, the, the charm, the grace that his mom had. And then he, in turn, created a self-fulfilling prophecy that, uh, you know, nobody's going to be able to do it for me. As Janice failed to meet his expectations, their relationship blew apart. Infidelities led to jealousy and quickly turned to rage. I had to go under, underground with my sister uh, for a week or two because he was threatening to kill her until he called one day and said, all right, uh, it's over. I want to see my girl. And she went back to him and 
you know, then they went on another vacation. Marvin had this ability to shoot himself in the foot. Uh, Marvin had this uh, ability or this uncanny uh, psychological mechanism uh, which would undermine happiness. Um, and he would figure out a way to complicate his life. He loved drama. Uh, he loved emotional drama. Um, um, he went for pain. Um, he found ways to hurt himself over and over and over again. It's very common that um, um, addicts and alcoholics will um, sabotage their own success because it's a lot easier to kind of stay in the addiction and get applause for doing 50%. Whereas if you're supposed to have it together, the expectation is that you're going to do 100%. With a constant supply of cocaine, Marvin was becoming the violent, controlling man who had tormented him as a child, his father. Marvin. On his last day, Marvin and his father are locked in a power struggle, seething at opposite ends of the house. A lifetime of resentment will soon end in tragedy. It's late morning. Marvin Gaye has just two hours to live. Marvin is staying with his parents in LA. Addicted to cocaine, he's suffering paranoid delusions. He thinks someone wants to kill him. His father is fed up with his son's madness and drug use. When he can't find some important business papers, his anger explodes. Mother! When he storms into Marvin's room, another bitter quarrel erupts. Mother, where are those papers? Marvin, his whole life, was told what to do. Not just by his father, but by Motown and everybody else. And when he came back home, things from the past just sort of built up. For the first time in his life, Marvin strikes his father. And I'm sure Marvin may have pushed him. <laughs> and when he fell, Marvin kicked him for what my mother said. And then he got up and went into his room. I've warned you. You don't talk to me. You don't do that. Marvin's father leaves the room humiliated. All respect for his authority gone. A lot of young men. They grow up in homes where they're under the thumb of an oppressive, critical parent who had convinced them all their lives that they weren't good enough. And so part of their growing up and coming into their own and being successful is an opportunity for them to say to the parent, screw you, I got the power now, see? I knew in my heart that if my brother or any of us struck my father that he would do something terrible. Because my father had always told us that he would if we ever did. Five years earlier, ravaged by his cocaine addiction, Marvin's career had stalled and he was on the run from the taxman. Federal agents had seized his house in L.A. for failure to pay taxes, and he was living out of a van in Hawaii. I'm trying to think of a good word to use for how he saw money. He was very free with it, for one thing. And he didn't take it truly serious. He didn't. He wasn't a person that cared about money, so you couldn't lure him into doing this and doing that by mentioning some figure. And it was just a, he was a kind-hearted person. He bought himself a Rolls Royce and bought himself a couple of houses and a place in Jamaica and never went to Jamaica. I mean, he just lived in chaos. In Hawaii, Marvin was running from his problems. 
He was at war with everyone, his wife Janice, Motown, and the IRS. That's where he fell into really great depression. And uh, his cocaine habit uh, worsened. You know, he was getting high all the time. I guess the whole thing about Hawaii was just sort of like take the people that were into the same kind of sadness and self-destructiveness and do it for a while. After seven months, mounting debt forces Marvin Gaye back onto the stage. But a tour in Britain ended in scandal when Gaye skipped a concert and left Princess Margaret waiting for hours. Once again, Marvin went into hiding, this time in Belgium. Away from the pressures and temptations of L.A., Marvin began to rally. In 1982, CBS paid $1.5 million to buy out his contract with Motown. And it was in Ostend where Marvin began to recover and build up enough strength to make his sort of last comeback. Marvin was off cocaine, but his failed relationships with women haunted him. Ritz visited him in Belgium, where he saw Gay's apartment filled with sadomasochistic drawings. I think he was tortured by the fact that he never had a good romantic female relationship. And I remember saying to Marvin, this is sick. Uh, what you really need is uh, sexual healing. And he said, I love that idea. I want you know, to sort of write a poem about it. So. I wrote these lyrics, and he, and he immediately took them and put a melody to it. Sexual Healing and the album Midnight Love became the first hits Marvin had had in nine years, winning him two Grammys. But back in L.A., he became hooked once again on cocaine. On his final concert tour, Marvin's addiction spiraled out of control. While millions of fans reveled in his performance, backstage, Marvin was self-destructing. It was not an easy tool to keep control of, and uh, it, it, it become pathetic because you had loved ones bringing in drugs, and you couldn't keep it away from it. I went to a couple of concerts, but I was not on the tour. I, I wouldn't even go close to it. It was crazy. He thought someone was trying to kill him. Marvin insisted on having his brother beside him at all times as a decoy for his imagined killer. They looked so much alike. The cocaine was driving Marvin insane. That is very consistent with heavy daily cocaine use. And, and actually, one of the, the number one reasons that we see um, addicts in a psychiatric unit is for a drug-induced psychosis. It's the beginning of, I think, the most tortured part of his life, when he loses his mind. And out of his mind, constructs a kind of a screenplay uh, of his own death. And uh, it all begins, I think, on this uh, uh, final tour. As the tour ground on, Marvin began stripping down to his underwear while seeing sexual healing. And to me, it was very sad uh, uh, because it showed that um, he wasn't feeling the love that people were offering him. And he was feeling like an object. Ultimately, he didn't understand that he was deeply loved by his fans, deeply loved for who he was, this complicated character. After the tour, a broken Marvin Gaye retreated to his parents' house. It was a fatal mistake. He returned to the uh, source of his psychological dilemma. And by now, it's worse. It's exacerbated by uh, his drug use, by his dad's alcoholism. Uh, there's no clarity. 
Marvin Gaye has less than one hour to live. In a violent argument, Marvin has just struck his father for the first time in his life. Some believe he knew exactly what the consequence would be. Kicking your father. Son. Marvin. I told him if you get, you keep bothering your father, he means it when he says, uh, I brought you in this world, and if you ever get me out, I'll take you out. After bringing breakfast to Marvin, his sister-in-law is back in her apartment next to the main house. Marvin's brother, Frankie, is with her. They're unaware of the fight going on next door. Marvin! Kicking... By beating his father, some believe Marvin had found a way to end his life. Marvin was really and truly, as he explained to me, in no uncertain terms, he didn't want to live. Without explanation, he just shot him. I heard the pops of the gun. Frankie, I just heard a gunshot. What shot? I didn't hear a thing. No, I heard two gunshots like two seconds ago. Are you sure? And he said, sure oh no, that was just a car on the freeway. It must have been. And I said, Frankie, it sounded like a gun to me. And he said, no, we live right next to the freeway, you know. collapsed in my arms and I'm asking her what's wrong what's wrong and all that I could hear was shot and I'm like you're shot and she said no my father shot her Marvin Gaye has been shot twice once in the shoulder once in the chest one of the bullets has damaged several vital organs and he's losing blood fast Marvin's brother, Frankie, rushes into the house, but he's cautious, scared that his father may attack again. Marvin is conscious when Frankie finds him. He yells to Irene to call 911 and then waits with his brother for the paramedics to arrive. His father is still armed and in the house. He was conscious when Frankie was holding him. But... Medics arrive in under 10 minutes, but they refuse to enter the house while Marvin's father and the gun are still inside. Father? Father? So I found father. He was sitting on his bed. Irene. And I'm asking him, where did you put the where gun, father? The gun? And he was just sitting there, very calm. And he looked up at me and said, What gun? What gun? It was just like he, there was nobody home. And I said, the paramedics are here and they need to come in and they won't come until the gun is outside. Please tell me where the gun is. And he just bowed his head. I was going through his drawers and everything, looking for the gun. And um, I flipped his pillow and it was under his pillow. Marvin is dying in his brother's arms. A full 20 minutes pass before paramedics can get to him. If Marvin didn't die on the spot, he died on his way to the hospital. I remember 
the one at the end of the stretcher asking me, did I know his name? And when I said, it's Marvin Gaye, he looked at me twice and he said, you don't mean the Marvin Gaye? And I said, yes, and he just started to cry. You can't really describe the hurt and the pain. Because when you love someone, it's just a hurt that you cannot describe. I remember coming out of a baseball game on that day, on April 1st, April Fool's Day, and hearing on the radio Marvin Gaye's, you know, father has shot and killed Marvin. And I thought to myself, that's how he's going to do it. Oh, my God. That's so Marvin, that's so perversely brilliant. The official time of death is 1.01 p.m., April 1st, 1984. The next day, Marvin Gaye would have turned 45. Marvin Gaye Sr. pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and received a five-year suspended sentence. His son remains one of the most influential musicians of his time.